We're looking now at topic eight, Muhammad and Jesus. And the readings for this uh, chapter are again from this book here, chapter five. And from the dialogue, it is chapters six and seven and 18 and 19. Those are the books, th those are the readings which are, should form the background for what we're talking about. You know, Muslims and Christians are so close together in so many ways. For example, both Muslims and Christians believe in prophets. True? Yes, we do. And both Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, if you just say Jesus to Muslims, they feel you are disrespectful. He is Isa al-Masih, Jesus the Messiah. So alhamdulillah, praise the Lord, we are agreed. But then as I said yesterday, so often when we find a convergence, you find within the convergence, there is divergence. So you start to probe a little bit and you hear your Muslim friends say, and Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Oh, and Jesus is only a prophet. Oh, so we are agreed, but even within the agreement about prophets, there is divergence. Or, praise the Lord, we both believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And then you ask your Muslim friend, and what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? And like we said yesterday, they will respond. He had a limited mission for a limited period of time only to the house of Israel. Muhammad had a universal mission, but not Jesus. You see. You remember we said yesterday how that within Islam, Adam is the primal prophet, Abraham is the middle prophet, and, Ma and Muhammad the final prophet. You could say these are sort of big three prophets because all three of these reestablished the worship of God at the black stone there where the Kaaba is, you see. And so you look at, at, at the significance of those three prophets. What about Jesus? Jesus is highly venerated, but he really is rather on the edges. He is not really at the center, you see. Um, and so, although we celebrate that we both believe Jesus is the Messiah, we find even in that confession, there is profound divergence. So we want to explore this a bit more that now, looking at Muhammad, role within Islam, and Jesus. So I'm looking at point one in the outline now. The Messiah is a mystery for Muslims. In fact, we'll start with the name of Jesus himself. Within the Quran, it is Isa. Isa. It's not Yesu. It's Isa. What does Isa mean? Yeshua? No. Isa has no meaning. It is a name without meaning. Oh, Jesus, Isa does, he's a miracle worker, born of the Virgin, and so forth. In terms of what he does, you could say there is meaning in the person, but the name itself carries no freight in terms of meaning, you see. The Arabic term for Yeshua would be Yeshu, you see. But that's not the name the Quran gives to Jesus. It is Isa. So in that little turn of name, so much is lost. In the biblical account, his name is Yeshua. What does Yeshua mean? Ah, the Yahweh, 
who came down. God is Yahweh who came down and met Moses at the burning bush. Why did he come down? To save his people from their sins, from their oppression. You know, this Yahweh has become incarnated in Jesus. Why did he come down in Jesus? So as to save us from our sins. It's the name, Yahshua means Yahweh saves. Yahshua is packed with meaning. But Isa, so much is lost, you see. And so, as we enter into conversations with our Muslim friends, we plead with them, come and meet the Injil, the Gospel accounts of Isa al-Masih, so that you may understand the fullness of who he is all about, you see. His name is Yahshua, Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's look now at some of the Quranic statements in regards to Jesus the Messiah. <clears throat> and I have Quranic references here for each of these statements. First, he is the Messiah. He is good news. By the way, Injil means good news. Jesus is good news. He is born of a virgin. He is the word of God, Kalimatullah. As we said uh, earlier today, however, when our Muslim friends say he is Kalimatullah, and then you press it, what does that mean? They will say, oh, it means that God spoke and he is miraculously created in the womb of the virgin, just as God spoke and Adam was miraculously created. And yet there's a sign here, which we can build upon, I believe, in our conversation about the nature of Jesus. He is the Spirit of God, Isaruhula, the Spirit of God. Again, you look in the New Testament accounts, Jesus is anointed with the Spirit of God. This is a sign which is helpful. He is a miracle worker. Jesus is without sin. Oh, that's very interesting. Muhammad is commanded by God in the Quran to ask forgiveness. Jesus is without sin. Wow. What does that mean? Jesus establishes the former scriptures. Or another way of saying it would be he fulfills them. In this course we develop for our Muslim friends, we talk about that. Jesus fulfills the scriptures. He establishes them. So what do these scriptures say about Jesus? Let's look at what the prophet said about his ministry and his life. Jesus brought the gospel. He predicted the coming of Muhammad. Oh, he predicted the coming of Muhammad, yes. So our Muslim friends scrounge through the New Testament, finding any references that they could believe would be a prediction about Muhammad, about Muhammad coming. He is not the son of God, but take note, that denial of the sonship of Jesus relates particularly to the notions that of, um, that of, of literal sonship, that he is the literal uh, son in the sense that God had sex with Mary and had a baby, that kind of thing. And it's polytheistic. It's, 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 it's an attack against polytheistic understandings, that denial of his sonship. He had a limited mission. Oh, Muhammad had a universal mission, but Jesus a limited mission. Hmm. He's rescued from death on the cross. Why is he rescued from death on the cross? Ah, it's because he's the Messiah. And the Messiah is anointed with the power of God. And God would never let the Messiah suffer on the cross. Oh, no. So God rescues him and takes him to heaven bodily. Someone else dies in his place, an illusion. It looks like Jesus was crucified, but it really wasn't. 
He is rescued from the cross because he is the Messiah. So he's taken to heaven without dying and he is returning at the end of history to get the world ready for the final judgment. And some of the Hadith suggests that he is um, coming as judge at the end of history. And so according to the Quran and Muslim, according to the Quran and Muslim theology, um, according to the Quran and Muslim theology, embraces some remarkable qualities in regards to Jesus. And there are hints of the gospel within the Quran, as we see right here in what we read. The virgin birth, the, the Messiah, good news, the word of God, the spirit of God, miracle work, the one without sin, coming back again at the end of history. There's a lots of signs of the gospel right in there. However, Islamic theology at its core um, does not embrace or accept the incarnation. In Islam, God does not meet us. He does not come down to suffer with us or among us. Islamic theology does not embrace or have space for the crucifixion. We don't, do not need an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And consequently, there is no resurrection, for Jesus was not crucified. He is not our resurrected Lord. We do not need an intercessor. So in very profound ways, Islam turns away from the gospel. Now, the very heart of the gospel is the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Those three central dimensions of what Jesus and the gospel is all about, Islam has turned away from that. So our we question you to is, participate in how the can we commend teaching and to Muslims project? the fullness of Jesus? Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities Jesus, will become available to people uh, around the world of the depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Let me just pause for um, comments or questions or response. When you talk with one of the imam and talks about the hell and how to get to heaven, yes. are you sure or not? Yes, yes. So here's the Jesus the way. Yes. And for him was really the big thing. Yes. That Jesus is the way early and you yes. get to heaven. I realized there's several other things that I mentioned. I thought, is, is what the Muslim mostly feel for Christianity that there's a law that's missing in Islam. There's a what? The law that's missing in Islam from God to people that's really attractive. That the love of God. Yeah. I most certainly, I believe that. I believe that very deeply. And I believe it is so urgent that a witness be given all over the world, including the Muslim world, that God is most fully revealed in the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross. That seeks to be embraced, seeks to, to invite us to reconciliation and forgiveness. Yes. What, what, that love is just astounding. What Muslims say to, uh, to the Christians when they say, when we usually quote, the God is love, whatever is good. Muslims don't use that term, God is love. What they do say is that God is merciful and compassionate. Uh, but he is always invulnerable. He is never affected by what we say. Yeah. Let me just push out on that a bit. And, um, and then we want to wrap up here looking at Muhammad now, his role in Islam. Um, <clears throat> when I was in um, Iran here recently, uh, recently, last May, a group of us Anabaptists were invited to Iran. We've been invited several times for dialogues with Muslim theologians at Qum, which uh, it, it's a great honor to be invited there. We just, we greatly, just deeply gratified for that invitation by our Muslim friends. And this particular time, the theme of these dialogues was on, on peacemaking and justice. And my paper was centered in the cross. And um, after my presentation, uh, one of the uh, participants on the Iranian side said, 
David, why is it that for you the cross is so central? Couldn't you just put the cross off to the side as a teaching which we disagree about? But it's to the side. It's really not central. And then we could find ourselves coming together. Um, but as long as you present the cross so centrally, it simply further um, presses the divide between us. And I said, you can't do that because the cross is central. I said, let me just illustrate by a story, a narrative. I said, there's many dimensions to the cross, but I'll just share about one dimension to the cross, which I recently experienced when I was in Khartoum, Sudan. And I was meeting with a group of widows from the wars in Darfur and the Nuba Mountains, all of whom are believers in Jesus the Messiah. They have become believers in him recently. And they're orphan and they're, and they're children. So these are orphan children. So I said, you cannot put the cross to the side because it's at the very center of the Christian faith. I said, let me just share a narrative uh, to explain what I mean. And there's many dimensions to the cross. This is just a revelation, an insight into one dimension of the cross. Recently, I was in Khartoum, I said, and I was invited to preach at a congregation of about 150 people. They were widows, mostly, from the wars in Darfur and the Nuba Mountains, and orphans, and just new believe, newly believing in Jesus the Messiah. And I shared with them that in Jesus the Messiah, God has participated fully in all that you have experienced. When he was a little baby, a little boy there in, in, uh, in, uh, in Galilee, why in Bethlehem area, and Herod ordered the death of all those little children that he had grown up with and that he was playing with, you know, just as your children have witnessed the death of their friends with whom they played. And then he became a refugee in Egypt, just as you have become refugees here in Khartoum from your homelands in Darfur and so forth. And, um, then he became a carpenter and worked hard. And he had no home, though, when he began his preaching ministry, just as many of you are homeless, you see. In all of this, he is participating in what you've experienced. And then he's put on a tree, on a cross, and his body is beaten and mutilated, just as your husbands and fathers and the men in your villages have been beaten and mutilated and hung on trees. Jesus also experienced all of that. This is God with us. So you're not alone. God is participating fully in all that you've experienced in Jesus. But on that cross, he forgives. He forgives. So that he, and then he resurrects from the dead and he sends out his spirit upon us. God raises him from the dead. He pours out his spirit upon us so that you can also forgive as he forgave. Be empowered to forgive as he forgave so that you will not be destroyed by the bitterness and the, uh, that, could, that could take root in your souls in the light of all that you've experienced. Jesus understands, and he empowers you to forgive and to transcend the horrible things you've experienced as he transcended uh, the horrible things he experienced in his resurrection. He invites you to participate in that resurrection power. That was my sermon. Then I said, after that, that sermon, these women went out into the courtyard after the church service, and for the next half hour, they sang and danced. And I didn't know the language, but there was one word I knew in the language, that was Jesus. They were singing and praising God for Jesus. And I said, in my sermon, if I would have said, because Jesus is the Messiah, he never experienced the suffering you have experienced. No, 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 no. God rescued him from the cross and took him bodily to heaven. Although your husbands have been killed and hung on trees and all of that, not Jesus. No, no, he is the Messiah. He is too righteous and wonderful for that. He went straight to heaven. He is immune from the suffering you've experienced. Do you think there would have been any singing in the courtyard that day? None whatsoever. You see, the cross is good news. The revelation of how much God loves us. And such good news for those Darfurian widows. Exactly right. They were, they were absolutely, I felt, deeply touched and impressed. And uh, during our next couple days, occasionally, there was references to, to this 
theme of the love of God revealed in Jesus the Messiah. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.